The candidates for governor getting some new endorsements, and we're going to take a look at the impact, plus new poll numbers for an embattled senator. They're tearing down houses and breaking hearts in Union Beach. A New Jerseyan runs for president of Iran. And Jim McGreevy is back. It's all ahead on NJ Today. Major funding for NJ Today provided in part by New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. New Jersey Association of Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njar.com. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. And by PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. Now stay tuned for NJ Today. From the production studios of Montclair State University, this is NJ Today with Mike Schneider. Hello once again. They are taking sides, rich, powerful, and or influential organizations lining up to support Governor uh, Christie or Senator Buono. Yesterday she got the police. Today he got the fire chiefs and the pipe fitters. And she got the Rutgers faculty. It goes on and it goes on. And we asked our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, to explain what does it really mean? Last week, it was the health professionals and allied employees, the nurses' union, that endorsed Buono. And we have in Senator Buono someone who's been an uh, unrelenting champion for the issues that have been important to us. Yesterday, the state's second largest police union, the Fraternal Order of Police, decided to skip its normal screening process and endorse Buono six months earlier than planned because it feels betrayed by Governor Christie. When he sat and met with us, he sat right across the table from me. He lied. He said he would not touch our pensions or benefits. He said he, being the United States attorney, he knew how important police officers were out there and what we went through, the trials and tribulations of uh, police officers in the street, and he would not touch our benefits. At Buono Campaign Headquarters in New Brunswick, where the signs aren't even in the windows yet, the recent endorsement by the NJEA and today's endorsement by the Rutgers Faculty Union have the candidate pumped. I can't keep track. It's kind of a good problem to have, though, isn't it? Yeah, we, the, the campaign has really caught fire. We're really excited. And what is the value of such an endorsement? It represents the voice of a unified message from a group of individuals that they have placed their faith in me as the next governor for the state of New Jersey. Governor Christie has the laborers union, the Port Authority police, and today got the National Pipe Fitters Union and the New Jersey Fire Chiefs Association. Buono recognizes not all union members follow their leaders, but says many do. The, you know, the leadership represents the membership, and they, they go back to the membership and talk to them and see what their sentiment is. She says the groups that have endorsed her are excited about the race. What they're saying to me is that they're excited about this race. They see that in Barbara Buono, there's somebody that's going to actually stand up to them, not castigate them, not scapegoat them. If endorsements were the entire race, Buono and Christie would be essentially even, but throw in name recognition and money, and the governor has a decided advantage. Outside Buono headquarters in New Brunswick, I'm Michael Aaron for NJ Today. Well, they have been called one of New Jersey's most politically connected engineering firms, but today the Birth Soul Services Group is standing accused of violating campaign finance laws, allegedly hiding almost $700,000 in campaign contributions while winning millions and millions of dollars in government contracts. A grand jury has indicted seven Birth Soul executives, including the former CEO, Howard Birth Soul, and it's also frozen the company's assets. The Ethics Committee may be investigating him, but Senator Bob Menendez is doing a bit better in the latest Quinnipiac poll. Forty percent of those polled approve of the job that he's doing. Thirty-seven percent give him a negative rating, and that pretty much is a reversal of the numbers from last month. But it's still well below the approval rating that Menendez got back in January before questions were raised about his involvement with a wealthy political donor. 
The pollsters also had some good news for Governor Christie and his campaign to protect our beaches. 69% of New Jersey residents agree that sand dunes and seawalls are a good idea. And 75% of shore residents feel likewise. Well, down the shore, there are plenty of stories of recovery these days. But we've also learned that sometimes recovery includes some heartbreaking scenes. Brenda Flanagan saw some of them today. Massive jaws take big bites of debris from the pile of rubble in Union Beach. While families watch, it dumps their homes into a waiting trash hauler, bite by bite. We now know how people in Kachina felt. Ashley Severino grew up here, played in the yard that's now buried in wreckage. You're just losing what you ever had in a matter of seconds. Ashley's granny lived across the street for 21 years. A demolition team tore her home down last week, leaving a muddy scar. How long did it take for them to tear it down? Not even a half hour. 21 years of memory, just squashed in a half hour. Every day there's another house going down. How many? Joe Mastorio's lost count. He walks his dog through the neighborhoods. It's devastating to the town. Hopefully by the summer they can get some more people back in. Superstorm Sandy leveled beach blocks and ruined many residences beyond repair in Union Beach. So far, borough officials say 153 houses have been torn down, with eight more scheduled for demolition this week. But many residents here want to rebuild. You can find foundations rising already, block by block. This is a new start for us. Clarence Tina Wingate's ready to rebuild her two-story home. Red chalk and twine outline the foundation footprint, but it's going to be raised up much higher than the last one. That means a lot of stairs to climb. That's my biggest concern really? about the stairs, especially when I do shopping. Contractors working to rebuild homes must look for markers like this one on the utility pole. It tells them how high up they're going to have to elevate the new structure. Which means that the foundation has to be up nine feet, just about. So you're going to elevate this home right. over above the flood water? Correct. The process, tearing down and building up, will take months, even years. Borough officials estimate 300 homes will be demolished here ultimately. Trash haulers witness the heartbreak over and over. And it's a shame to see what people actually need to go through, especially up here from what I heard a lot of people actually walking away from their houses. Those houses ripped up and crushed into garbage trucks are now headed for landfills in Pennsylvania. In Union Beach, Brenda Flanagan for NJ Today. More police on the street, and that tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop is Patterson, which just got state permission to rehire another 21 police officers. They were among the 125 laid off during the budget crisis a couple of years ago. Police officials say they can now reestablish their anti-crime unit to battle the surging crime rate. Our next stop is Newark, where the UMDNJ merger means a name change for that institution. Starting July 1st, it will be known as the Rutgers Health Science Campus at Newark. Officials say that should help with marketing and with the public understanding of its role in the Rutgers system. And our final stop is Princeton, where they're having a hard time giving away seven free homes. That's right, free properties, duplexes and apartment houses. Princeton University wants to clear them out for redevelopment, but the new owner must pay to pick them up and move them elsewhere. And that's your Garden State Express for Wednesday, the 27th of March. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. It seems so obvious, falling trees take down power lines. We keep learning that the hard way. But now one utility company is actually taking to the skies to do something about it. Here's our senior correspondent, Desiree Taylor. Hovering above the trees in Mercer County Park is a helicopter equipped with a saw consisting of multiple 24-inch rotary blades. This so-called aerial saw is JCPNL's latest technique for trimming trees. It saves us, it saves a ton of time. Right? And roughly right now, um, we're projecting about a 50% cost 
you know, uh, cost barriers. The transmission lines are the backbone of our system. So a tree touching a transmission line can take tens of thousands of customers out of service. And when that happens, we also are subject to serious fines. So we don't want that to happen. This trimming is mandated, and this is the best way to do it. JCPNL first started using the aerial saws to help clean up after Superstorm Sandy. Officials say it was so effective they decided to make it a part of the utility company's overall vegetation management program. We do trimming, for instance, along our distribution lines, which are the lines you see along the streets on a five-year cycle. We're out there doing that. We spend, you know, on an average, well, last year, for instance, we spent about $24 million just on that program, which is the neighborhood program. And this is the transmission lines, and this is several million dollars as well, in addition to what we spend in the neighborhoods. JCPNL officials say it's isolated areas like this one where the aerial saws are most effective because they can cut the trees from top to bottom without the need for heavy trucks and equipment. This tool is new for JCPNL, but its parent company, First Energy, has been using aerial saws for 16 years, and officials claim the impact to trees is no different than traditional tree trimming methods, but Kate Millsaps of the New Jersey Sierra Club has concerns. It essentially results in a clear cut. The cuttings are done indiscriminately. There's nobody on the ground to ensure that there's no um, critical species in the area or what resources are being impacted by the cuts. It meets ANSI 300 standards for mechanical trimming. Does it make it so that there's a uh, you know, nice natural canopy? No. But one of the reasons why we have the issues is that natural canopy is coming into our right of way. We have to turn around and trim that back. So it's much more effective to turn around and do it this way. Morano says this is not clear cutting and the trimming is required by state and federal law. The aerial saw will not be used to trim trees in residential areas unless safety buffers are in place. JCPNL expects this method will be used every eight to ten years. For NJ Today, I'm Desiree Taylor in West Windsor. We have been hearing a lot about FEMA trailers ever since the hurricane hit us. Some say it simply took too long for them to get here. But tonight, Brian Donahue of the Star-Ledger introduces us to some of the storm victims who are still living in them. You remember them probably from Hurricane Katrina when they became a symbol of the long-term displacement and frustrations of storm victims along the Gulf Coast. Now, they're providing a roof over the heads of scores of Hurricane Sandy victims in New Jersey. For many grateful folks like 77-year-old Fred Ziegler, they are a much welcome refuge. But they're also a cold, hard symbol of how long the road is proving to be as they try to get back to their real homes. Before he can move back in, he needs to get the mold remediated, the furnace replaced, the house rewired, new floors and sheetrock installed, and new appliances, and probably the house lifted to a new elevation. All on a $30,000 FEMA grant and his monthly Social Security check. Oh, man, this thing. I shouldn't even be doing this. I'll feel it tonight. What money I got from FEMA? That's what it would have cost to take out the walls and pull all this up. Not put nothing down. There would be no money left to, to rebuild. Like Ziegler, Vera Pizzo makes the trip each day from her FEMA trailer in Farmingdale to her home in Long Branch, hey. a home that's been in her family for half a century. It was flooded with two feet of water when the storm surge pushed up into this small creek at the end of the street. Like thousands of others, she's still haggling with her insurance company for the money to start rebuilding. And we have cats coming in because the house is so, so racked that they're getting in. We can't even close the windows down below. It's fashionable to criticize FEMA these days, but like Ziegler, Pizza was full of phrase for the agents who found her the trailer. Thankful for a comfortable place to stay until she can get back into her home, although she's not quite sure when that will be. So I've got just a lot that has to get done, but now that we're moved into the trailer, thanks to FEMA, um, I've got somewhere where we can stay, where it's warm and healthy. For now, she's settling in trying to make her trailer feel as much like home as possible, but hoping it won't be home for long. We have some mixed news this evening on the housing front. Home values across this country jumped 8% for the year ending in January. That is from the Case-Shiller Home Price Index. 
And analysts say it's the biggest price increase we've seen since the burst of the housing bubble. But things were a little different for folks in the region that includes North Jersey, where the average price increase was in fact less than 1%. All right, question for you. How bad are things at the bankrupt Revel Resort in Atlantic City? Today, one of Revel's lawyers went into court and told a bankruptcy judge that they were running out of money and they would have to liquidate, close their doors if they didn't get immediate help. The judge then approved a $250 million emergency financing plan. And Revel executives say that now should be enough to keep them afloat as they reorganize their operations. New Jersey officials took a look at the dangers posed by synthetic marijuana, and last week they banned it. Senator Kip Bateman was a driving force behind the new law, and he joins us now. Welcome. Good to have you here. Mike, thanks for having me. How did you first find out about the dangers posed well, by actually, some of this is called K2 and yeah, some K2, other names? K2, Spice, there's all yeah. kinds of street names. Um, actually, you know, I, I, one of the, my jobs is I prosecute in a couple towns, and a couple of years ago, some of the local police came to me and said, you know, Kip, this is a real problem because these things are being sold legally and they're really being used as, you know, for illegal purposes. And what happens is it's really a chemical compound, uh, synthetic marijuana, that individuals, you know, young adults, uh, teenagers end up smoking. And, and what's it's been happened, linked in some cases to some borderline psychotic behavior. Oh, absolutely. You've heard about some crazy stories of individuals after they ingested the drug, you know, killed their dog, ate their dog. I mean, it's really bad stuff. And what's happened is in 2010, there was 3,000 calls to poison control centers around the country about this. In 2011, it went up to 7,000 mm. calls. And New Jersey's had a in 2011, 150 calls, and the problem is it has incredible uh, health effects. And so, uh, Senator Turner and I got together, put this legislation through the Senate, which makes it a crime to manufacture, distribute, uh, possess, or obtain synthetic marijuana. And, and the penalties are, are fairly strict on this. They are. Right it now. goes from first degree to fourth degree, depending on the amount, depending on the substance. But um, to get these off the street, and the problem is they're being sold in like convenience stores, um, smoke shops, drug paraphernalia stores. 7-Elevens, and so we want to get them off the market because they do have a disclaimer, not for uh, human consumption, but people use it, obviously, to get high and whatnot. So as a legislator, you've done your job as a prosecutor. When these cases are presented to you for possible prosecution, I mean, some of these offenders obviously will be juveniles. How will they be handled? Oh, yeah, a lot of them are under 18, and then they go to juvenile court, superior court. Uh, depending on the degree, will end up, like if it's under 50 grams, end up in municipal court. If not, it goes to superior court. So I, I, every week in municipal court, I see a lot of the cases dealing primarily with marijuana, but we have seen some of these other marijuana synthetic uh, cases. And what about those who do sell and dispense to this? I mean, is, oh, that, the is that where the, the, the crackdown will come? Yeah, the crackdown on, this, on the users, but also on the stores that have been selling these things, yep. you know, under the, the guise of legal, legal um, consumption. Do it's most not, of these merchants know what they were dealing with? Yeah, I think so. And what happened in a couple of my towns, in particular, Bound Brook, the police actually started going around to the store and said, hey, you know what, you can't be selling this stuff. And a lot of them listened and took them off their, off their shelves. But it, it's, it, it's significant legislation because it's going to save people's lives because this, you, know, you don't know what kind of impact it's going to have on your body. And a lot of people have overdosed and a lot of people have done crazy things on these drugs. So. Well, I have you here. We've got about a minute left. I want to talk to you about another <clears throat> a bill that you're working on right now. This one would require the utility companies to wherever rate hikes are being proposed to hold but public hearings in each yes, county. Yes, right. Right now, you were uh, not happy with JCPNL's performance after no, the storm, I wasn't. and your words were pretty strong. Yeah, very strong. And you know, my district got devastated. And you know, there's no question it was a, probably the most severe storm that's hit New Jersey. But you know, in a lot of my towns, you know, especially that the ones that were serviced by JCPNL, they've lost power maybe 10, 12 times. And so now JCP now is going for a 4.5% rate increase. Well, the legislation in t mandates that they have hearings in the service areas. Well, right now they have six scheduled in Monmouth, Ocean, Middlesex counties. None in my district. So my uh, running mates, Assemblyman Cittarelli and Assemblywoman Simon and I have put in legislation saying, listen, if, if the service area is going to be impacted by a increase, rate increases, they should have an opportunity to have a public hearing. And, is there any way their, in your mind that they can justify a rate increase given the performance that you've witnessed? It's going to be very difficult. It really is. I mean, they're going to have to make a strong case. I don't think now's the time. I'm not to, not to say that down the road possibly, but right now I think people, you know, not only just the last storm, but there's been a series of storms and a series of uh, shortages and you know, power outages. I, I think right now is not the time for a rate increase. Senator, have to leave it there. Thank you for coming in, sir. Mike, thanks for having me.
A New Jerseyan has been traveling the world raising funds for his presidential campaign. And we're not talking about Governor Christie. We're talking about a Rutgers University professor, Hushang Amir Hamadi. And he is running for president of Iran. And he joins us now. Welcome. Pleasure to have thank you with you, us. Mike, and thank you for having me. You have lived in this country for four decades. You are a dual citizen. You're a U.S. citizen as that well as an right. Iranian citizen. Why are you doing this? Well, I think uh, Iran has become an international issue. And uh, every morning you get up, I Iran is in the news all over. And the international community has at stake in, in a better Iran. I'm trying to help. I'm trying to bring that country back to where it was, to a better place. My understanding is that presidential candidates must be approved by the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei. Have you approached the Supreme Leader for approval? Well, it is approved by the Guardian Council, which is appointed by the uh, Supreme Leader. I have had uh, discussions and, and meetings with the Guardian Council. Uh, I also have some report with the uh, leader's office. Uh, I am not going to say I don't, I cannot say that I am, uh, I am, uh, I have convinced them to approve me. But uh, well, I will not be that easily dismissed either. Well, there are some of your colleagues, though, even in this country, who say it's a long shot at best because of the fact that you are a U.S. citizen. How well, you... first, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a misunderstanding. Iranian law does not recognize dual citizenship. For example, over the last uh, four decades, I have been voting in every Iranian election. And I have an Iranian passport. I go to Iran. They've never even asked me if I have an American passport or no. Iranian law does not recognize dual citizenship. And if you are an Iranian citizen, you are an Iranian citizen unless two things happen. First, that you write and revoke your citizenship, or the government writes to you for whatever reason revokes it. None of the two has happened to me. And therefore, from the legal perspective, the Islamic Republic cannot uh, argue against my citizenship. There's been no doubt. Most Americans know about this, this confrontation that seems to have existed since the fall of the Shah between these two countries. Uh, one of the major bones of contention certainly can, includes the Iranian nuclear enrichment program. That's right. You've been quoted as saying that Iran does have the right to enrich uranium. Yes, but within the, the obligations that it has. I mean, Iran is a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. According to that treaty, Iran has the right to civilian uh, nuclear uh, technology. But then again, within that same treaty, Iran has obligations, and most important of which is transparency. So if you were to become president of Iran, you would pursue nuclear enrichment? Well, I would really think about it. I would keep, of course, the right. But I think the problem with Iran's nuclear enrichment is not really the enrichment itself. Uh, it's the trust that the international community has lost in the Islamic Republic. Can you blame most of the community for feeling that lack of trust? Well, the lack of trust on both sides, but unfortunately, it is largely from the Iran side, unfortunately, because the Islamic Republic should have uh, been more transparent than it has been in the past. Who do you blame for that? Is it, is it the supreme leader? Is it President Ahmadinejad? No, it, it started before uh, Ahmadinejad. It goes back to almost 20 years, the, the history of this. Actually, originally, it, it goes back to the Shah's time. Mm -hmm. But uh, most recently, it really at least goes to 20 years. Would, but you, the be, problem would is, you repudiate the things that Ahmadinejad has said that has offended so many people? Oh, in absolutely. This I think it's, it's, uh, I condemn them. I repudiate them. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's un, uh, uncalled for, unjustified. Uh, I think uh, Israel is a reality. Israel uh, has every right to exist just like any other nation. I think, uh, yes, I do, of course. There has been, uh, well, only uh, time has gone by far too quickly, but only uh, there is a great consensus within much of the body politic in this country that those who seek higher office in Iran and who do not do the bidding of the Supreme Leader are headed for serious trouble and that their candidacies, in fact, have been plagued and their supporters have in some cases been killed. Does that concern you? Not really. I mean, it depends. There are, the Islamic Republic has certain red lines. And if you don't pass the red lines, you are okay. But then I've been very careful. I have, I have learned over the last 30 years uh, to, to learn first about those red lines and stay, you know, in this side of that red line. That it's very important to understand that. But I think uh, I would be safe. 
Well, we appreciate your coming in. We will watch this with great interest, sir. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you for having me. I do appreciate this. Finally tonight, he's back, former Governor Jim McGreevy. He resigned in disgrace almost nine years ago, declared that he's a gay man, got a divorce, became an Episcopal priest, and started counseling prisoners and other people in crisis. All that has now been documented in a new film called Fall to Grace, which had its Jersey premiere in Union last night. And today, McGreevy faced questions from our David Cruz, subbing for Brian Lair on WNYC Radio. I wonder when, when you're back in Trenton, uh, do, what your feeling is when you're around that environment before. It seems to me it'd be kind of like a junkie going back to a shooting gallery. <laughs> um, close. I, I, I've, I've shared to the governor that <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but it's, it's, it's um, the legislative, legislative process is, uh, I think, to paraphrase Mark Twain's anecdote is, you know, or it might have been Bismarck, something like watching baloney being made. But no, it, it's, not a, it's, it's not the place I'd prefer to be. Former Governor McGreevy with our David Cruz. That does it for us coming up tomorrow. The impact Hurricane Sandy continues to have on summer rentals down the shore. The impact of 60 years of industrial pollution on Tom's River and a doctor determined to fight the Death with Dignity Act. Till then, I'm Mike Schneider. We thank you very much for watching. Hope to see you back here again tomorrow. Good night. At psc and g we believe helping the people of New Jersey goes hand in hand with providing service to our customers. Helping to make the psc and g Children's Hospital a reality. <laughs> Spearheading community educational programs and sponsoring local teams that make our New Jersey neighborhoods so special. These are just a few of the things we're proud to do for the people of our great state. psc and g we make things work for New Jersey. Next on NJTV, BBC World News.